and here was the gas station, its attendants busy now with customers. Approaching from the rear, Montag entered the men's washroom. Through the aluminum wall, he heard a radio voice saying, War has been declared. The gas was being pumped outside. The men in the Beatles were talking, and the attendants were talking about the engines, the gas, the money owed. Montag stood trying to make himself feel the shock of the quiet statement from the radio. But nothing would happen. The war would have to wait for him to come to it in his personal file. An hour, two hours from now. He washed his hands and face and toweled himself dry, making little sound. He came out of the washroom and shut the door carefully and walked into the darkness and at last stood again on the edge of the empty boulevard. There it lay, a game for him to win, a vast bowling alley in the cool morning. The boulevard was as clean as the surface of an arena two minutes before the appearance of certain unnamed victims and certain unknown killers. The air over and above the vast concrete river trembled with the warmth of Montag's body alone. It was incredible how he felt his temperature could cause the whole immediate world to vibrate. He was a phosphorescent target. He knew it. He felt it. And now he must begin his little walk. Three blocks away, a few headlights glared. Montag drew a deep breath. His lungs were like burning brooms in his chest. His mouth was sucked dry from running. His throat tasted of bloody iron, and there was rusted steel in his feet. What about those lights there? Once you started walking, you'd have to gauge how fast those beetles could make it down here. Well, how far was it to the other curb? It seemed like a hundred yards. Probably not a hundred, but figure for that anyway. Figure that with him going very slowly at a nice stroll, it might take as much as... 30 seconds, 40 seconds to walk all that way. The Beatles, once started, they could leave three blocks behind them in about 15 seconds. So even if halfway across he started to run, he put his right foot out, and then his left foot, and then his right. He walked on the empty avenue. Even if the street were entirely empty, of course, you couldn't be sure of a safe crossing for a car could appear suddenly over the rise four blocks farther on and be on and past you before you had taken a dozen breaths. He decided not to count his steps. He looked neither to left nor right. The light from the overhead lamp seemed as bright and revealing as the midday sun, and just as hot. He listened to the sound of the car picking up speed two blocks away on his right. Its movable headlights jerked back and forth suddenly and caught at Montag. Keep going. Montag faltered, got a grip on the books, and forced himself not to freeze. Instinctively, he took a few quick running steps, then talked out loud to himself and pulled up to stroll again. He was now half across the street, but the roar from the Beatles' engines whined higher as it put on speed. The police, of course, they see me. But slow now, slow, quiet, don't turn, don't look, don't seem concerned. Walk, that's it. Walk. Walk. The beetle was rushing. The beetle was roaring. The beetle raised its speed. The beetle was whining. The beetle was in high thunder. The beetle came skimming. The beetle came in a single whistling trajectory fired from an invisible rifle. It was up to 120 miles per hour. It was up to 130 at least. Montag clamped his jaws. The heat of the racing headlights burnt his cheeks, it seemed and jittered his eyelids and flushed the sour sweat out all over his body. He began to shuffle idiotically and talk to himself, and then he broke and just ran. He put out his legs as far as they would go, and down, and then far out again, and down, and back, and out, and down, and back. God. God. He dropped a book, broke pace, almost turned, changed his mind, plunged on, yelling in concrete emptiness, the beetle scuttling after its running food. Two hundred. One hundred feet away, ninety, eighty, seventy, Montag gasping, flailing his hands, legs, up, down, out, up, down, out, closer, closer, hooting, calling. His eyes burnt white now as his head jerked about to confront the flashing glare. Now the beetle was swallowed in its own light. Now it was nothing but a torch hurtling upon him, all sound, all blare. Now, almost on top of him, he stumbled and fell. I'm done. It's over.
but the falling made a difference. An instant before reaching him, the wild beetle cut and swerved out. It was gone. Montag lay flat, his head down. Wisps of laughter trailed back to him with the blue exhaust from the beetle. His right hand was extended above him, flat. Across the extreme tip of his middle finger, he saw now, as he lifted that hand, a faint sixteenth of an inch of black tread where the tire had touched in passing. He looked at that black line with disbelief, getting to his feet. That wasn't the police, he thought. He looked down the boulevard. It was clear now. A car full of children, all ages, God knew from twelve to sixteen, out, whistling, yelling, hurrahing, had seen a man, a very extraordinary sight, a man strolling, a rarity, and simply said, let's get him, not knowing he was the fugitive Mr. Montag. Simply a number of children out for a long night of roaring five or six hundred miles in a few moonlit hours, their faces icy with wind, and coming home or not coming at dawn, alive or not alive, that made the adventure. They would have killed me, thought Montag, swaying. The air still torn and stirring about him in dust, touching his bruised cheek. For no reason at all in the world, they would have killed me. He walked toward the far curb, telling each foot to go and keep going. Somehow he had picked up the spilled books. He didn't remember bending or touching them. He kept moving them from hand to hand as if they were a poker hand he could not figure. I wonder if they were the ones who killed Clarice. He stopped, and his mind said it again very loud. I wonder if they were the ones who killed Clarice. He wanted to run after them, yelling. His eyes watered. The thing that had saved him was falling flat. The driver of that car, seeing Montag down, instinctively considered the probability that running over a body at such a high speed might turn the car upside down and spill them out. If Montag had remained an upright target, Montag gasped. Far down the boulevard, four blocks away, the beetle had slowed, spun about on two wheels, and was now racing back, slanting over on the wrong side of the street, picking up speed. But Montag was gone hidden in the safety of the dark alley for which he had set out on a long journey, an hour, or was it a minute, ago. He stood shivering in the night, looking back out as the beetle ran by and skidded back to the center of the avenue, whirling laughter in the air all about it. Gone. Farther on, as Montag moved in darkness, he could see the helicopters falling, falling like the first flakes of snow in the long winter to come.